And good morning, my friends. Kurt Bergen with you from a very sunny, warm, and slightly sweaty Barranquilla, Colombia. That's right, I'm on location today, but I want to talk about Pocket Pennant Run and uh, some homebrew rules uh, to give you something to think about. I've not tested any of these rules with any amount of data at all. So keep that in mind. If you try these out, I'd love it if you would let me know how uh, you think they are. Uh, but these are just some first uh, sort of responses to ways to maybe tweak the game a little bit to enhance your play experience. I wanna say, first of all, that Pocket Pennant Run is a wonderful traveling companion. I am a long, long way from home right now, but this fit very easily into my suitcase. And wow, uh, I've got a wonderful game with me that uh, I can continue to use on vacation and annoy friends and family. And isn't that really what it's all about? The first thing I want to say about Pocket Pennant Run uh, before we get into the homebrew rules is that in just in the uh, short amount, the small amount of games that I have played so far, I'm noticing that there's an awful lot of strategy to the game. And I'm not just talking about the choices of uh, when to bunt, when to steal, when to hit and run, the usual stuff but I'm talking about the interaction that you have to decide upon when you are changing pitchers and number one, and number two, choosing a pinch hitter because there are two factors to consider in each of those decisions. For bringing in a relief pitcher, to start there, to bring in a relief pitcher, you have to really make a conscious choice are you looking at the overall effectiveness of the pitcher, the pitcher grade rating, or are you looking at the control rating? Because there are times when that control rating might be more important to you than the pitcher overall grade rating. So for example, if you have a, um, I don't know, a B pitcher with a D control rating that might be worse to you than a C pitcher with a C control rating. Now if you look at the pitcher cards you'll notice that there are two opportunities to go to the control card for letter A pitchers. There are two opportunities to go to the control card for letter B pitchers. There are two opportunities to go to the control card for letter C pitchers. There's only one for letter D pitchers, so control becomes less important for the worst pitchers that are graded, and you have more opportunities to go to the batter card as a result. Um, so that's an interesting dynamic, choosing there. And then, of course, when you're looking at a pinch hitter, uh, power is sometimes something that you would want over and above the uh, overall batter effectiveness. So if you have, for example, a C batter with A power, that might be better for you than a B batter with B power. So there's a lot of the strategic decision <coughs> excuse me, making to make in the game that you may not at first blush be thinking about. And it's something that I'm enjoying uh, trying to figure out uh, what the best strategies are at particular moments. So, with no, with that said, and no further ado, let's go to some home brew options for Pocket Pennant Run. The first comment that um, I want to address about the game that I wanted to take on is the issue of pop-outs in the infield. How could you construct or change some of the defensive play outcomes so that you could add pop-outs in the infield to the mix. And I think we found one. If you look at the defensive play card here, 
um, there are a few opportunities in each column if the ball is hit on the infield where a fielder's choice becomes something that comes into play. But, of course, if you have a uh, bases empty situation, the fielder's choice doesn't matter. That would be an excellent opportunity to, uh, instead of having that ground ball go to the fielder for a fielder's choice, make it a pop-out. So if you have a 4-6 fielder's choice opportunity on your defensive card, if you change it to a pop-out to second instead, you don't change anything, but you maybe make the mix of your defensive outcomes more interesting on your scorecard. So, uh, for example, let's say you have a B fielder and you roll a four right there. So you have a GL outcome right there. The GL outcome gets the leading runner. But there's no leading runner if there's nobody on base. So you could make that a pop-out situation. The other way you could go is to make the lowest fielder's choice outcome on each column. So for example, in the A column on the infield, that would be five, right there. In the B column in the infield, it would be four. In the C column on the infield, it would be three. And on the D column, it would be two. Because for each letter grade that the ball is hit on the infield, for each letter grade, of course, you have diminishing odds of double play results. So if you take that lowest number in each column, regardless of whether they are hit uh, with a runner on base or not, you could turn those into your pop-outs and add to your diversity in the uh, defensive results that you get, okay? Second, let's talk about infield in. Uh, there's a few ways you could do infield in as well. Again, if you've got your defensive play card and you're looking at that, it would not be difficult to say, and again, we would have to play test these as a community. I haven't tried these uh, for more than two games myself, but um, you could leave your one's outcome as double play chances because with the infield in, you still have a chance for a double play result by maybe a home to first double play. So you could leave those alone, but your other double play outcomes might become singles. Uh, and then you could just change in the fielder's choice to the runner holds and the runner advances to the runner holds at third as well. Um, just an idea there. Some tweaking with the defensive card. If you take a look at that, there's a number of ways you could go. The struggle that I'm having, and maybe you've got some thoughts about this, is if you look at the card, how can you adjust the ratings on the card to get a realistic way of managing the infield in while you don't over penalize with too many singles the cost of playing the infield in. So it's kind of a, a push and pull a little bit. But what I've done is I've turned all of the double play outcomes, except for the top row, the number one results, I've turned all of those into singles. I've kept the other double plays and I've kept the um, runner holding the rest of the time, except of course, for the single and error results at the bottom of the column, I left those as is. 
But my concern with that is that by doing so, I have over-penalized the defense for playing the infield in by turning those double play opportunities into singles. I also am not sure that I've penalized the D column enough for being in because they don't have as many double play outcomes. So I'm struggling with that a little bit. I'd love to read your thoughts. Um, the last one that I want to talk about today is pitcher fatigue. Now, pitcher fatigue is a thorny issue for any uh, baseball sim. Uh, there are a few ways that um, I've come up with for options to manage pitcher fatigue. We know that the rules say that as soon as you hit your inning limit, as soon as you hit your inning limit for uh, any pitcher, a starting pitcher, maybe he's got an, a fatigue number of seven, so he goes seven innings, as soon as the eighth inning starts, boom, he's down a letter grade. You can house rule that to keep that if he's throwing a shutout or something like that. But the fatigue number is the first way that you reduce in ineffectiveness. That deals with this card. So you're down a letter on this card as a result of hitting that inning limit or giving up more than four runs, whether they're earned or unearned, you, you drop a letter grade as well. And this is your pitcher effectiveness card. But the question has come up, okay, what do I do if my pitcher is a D pitcher or if I have a C pitcher maybe who's two innings past his limit, now he's down to a D, just stays at a D? Is that enough of a penalty? Well, I've looked at some different options using the cards that we have in the game. How could we use these to penalize the pitcher beyond being a D? Of course, on this card, there's no additional penalty. You can't go lower than a D. So what do you do? Well, there are several options that I'm tinkering with, and I'd love to hear your thoughts about these. The first one, and of course, you, you lose your platoon advantage. That's, I guess that would be the, the, the next drop, is you lose your platoon advantage. Um, but you can increase each batter's letter grade by one be after a pitcher hits that bottom fatigue limit. So if you have a D batter, now he's a C batter. You could do that. That would increase batting average. Uh, it would increase, it could increase power, although there isn't a power increase between B to C, or C to B, uh, but it could increase power. It could also increase your uh, slugging percentage a little bit. The other thing, or another thing that you could do, if your pitcher is beyond that D limit, you can increase the batter's power. The thinking here that I was brainstorming, okay, what happens when a pitcher is tired? Well, they hang more pitches, is one effect. What happens then? Well, there's more extra base hits. So if you bumped, you left the batter rating alone, but you bumped the power by a letter. Okay, what happens there? Well, you're more likely, you're increasing your slugging percentage is one thing you're doing. You're also increasing your batting average because if you get on the power card, as you can see, you have uh, an opportunity to make outs still. But if you increase the power letter because the pitcher is fatigued, that may be a good way to penalize the pitcher for hanging around or the manager for hang, letting the pitcher hang around after he's tired. There's another option. Each pitcher, in addition to that pitching effectiveness grade, again, we've dropped him to a D at this point, but he maintains his control factor. What if we dropped the control factor a grade? So if it's a D pitcher with a C control factor, now, maybe you drop that control factor from a C to a D, and maybe that's your penalty. What that does, of course, is it simulates what happens when pitchers get tired. Well, not only do they give up more home runs, they give up more walks, and they don't strike out as many batters. 
this would simulate the loss of control, the loss of uh, the addition of wildness. So those are three pitcher sort of consequences for fatigue in the game. Beyond dropping to a D, beyond losing your platoon split advantage when you're a pitcher and you have the platoon advantage, but now you lose that because you're fatigued. Beyond those two, you can increase the batter letter grade as an additional penalty. You can increase the power of the batter or and or because you could do some combination of these as well and or you could decrease the control rating of the pitcher and gradually nudge him down toward a d letter grade as well all right so those are some play options that i wanted to throw out there some home brew rules for pocket pennant run for you to think about the pop out uh, addition to the defensive card. The second one is the infield in option uh, and how to play that. I think we're close to something that'll work for that on both of those for both for pop outs and for the infield in. And then to take pitcher fatigue to another level. What I'm seeing by the way and I haven't run the metrics on this but what I'm seeing is that there's a lot of D pitchers or there's a lot of C and D pitchers, especially on teams that are not very good. And so to, ad to penalize additionally that pitcher who is either starting at the D level or becomes a D very early on uh, might be something that you come across more often than you would think. It's not a bell curve, at least it doesn't look like you have 25% A's, 25% B's, 25% C's, and 25% D pitchers. I don't think it works like that. It seems like it's more in the C and D range with fewer A's, but that's just what I'm seeing so far. I could be wrong about that. Let me know if you differ. I'm enjoying the, uh, the game a lot, and uh, I'm, I'm wondering, sort of out loud as an aside, I am wondering if this is not just a fun game, but it's sort of challenging the sim world to find a very playable, not quick play, because this you're not just rolling the dice a couple times and you're getting an outcome for a game. You're not. This is a, what I would call a fast play game where you're not going to be spending an hour to play the game, but you're going to get stats that are pretty close. You're going to get all the strategic options that you could have in a regular game as well. And as I told you at the start of my video, this travels absurdly well. I was even looking at this on the plane. Um, I was looking at the cards and the rules on the plane and I'm sure annoying all of the people in my uh, seat area. So with all that said, I wanted to get out some ideas about homebrew rules and to really encourage you to look at the strategic choices that you have to make when you play Pocket Pennant Run. I'm gonna put the link for the game in the uh, description for the video if you wanna check it out. The website's live hard copies of the box, the, the rules, the scorecards, all that stuff uh, are, have been ordered, I understand. If you haven't joined the Facebook community, I would encourage you to do that. Even if you haven't bought the game, it gives you a better idea what people are looking at with the game. Uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful product, and I think it might be blazing a new trail, creating a new genre of baseball sims, maybe sports sims generally. And uh, as we look at what sports gaming is going to look like uh, over the next few decades. So um, pocket pennant run, uh, take a look and let me know in the comments what you think of these homebrew rule ideas. And let's work as a community to make these even stronger. Hope you have a wonderful day. I'm Kurt Berglund. Please don't forget to click like and subscribe to my channel. I need your help to keep my, my channel going, my friends. And I do appreciate that very much. Happy, happy, and healthy New Year. So long, everybody.